Coming up next on Twill, we'll be talking to Professor Spencer Waller, Ryan Radia, and Lisa Baradkin about all kinds of interesting things dealing with the Comcast Time Warner merger. We'll talk about privacy. Uh, we'll talk about trademarks, terms of service, uh, and a number of other great things. Next on Twill. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Law is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twill, This Week in Law, episode 247, recorded February 21st, 2014. Mergers of Dystopia. This episode of Twill is brought to you by Scotty Vest technology-enabled clothing to carry all of your gadgets. Visit scottyvest.com slash twit now through February 24th to save 40% off 14 of their best sellers. That's scottyvest.com slash twit and use the code twit13 at checkout. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 247 of This Week in Law. This is where we get together every week and take a detailed look at the law and policy issues that affect technology. And, you know, we otherwise pontificate and comment and generally have a pretty good time here. Uh, I'm Evan Brown in Chicago hosting the show this week while Denise is out. Uh, So let me introduce you to our terrific guests. Uh, Spencer Weber Waller is a professor at Loyola University uh, Chicago School of Law and the faculty director of the Institute for Consumer Antitrust Studies. He teaches antitrust law, civil procedure, and other subjects. Uh, Welcome to the program, Professor Waller. Hi, Evan. Thanks for having me. Well, it's great to have you here, and it's great to have Chicago well represented today. So looking forward to our our conversation here. Uh, I'd also like to welcome back to the show Ryan Radia, Associate Director of Technology Studies at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Uh, CEI is a public policy organization that pushes limited government, free enterprise, and individual liberty. I think this pretty much uh, sums it up, Ryan. Let me know if you agree uh, to to note that Ron Paul has uh, praised CEI and Al Gore has lamented it. Does that does that do it justice for for a description? Give people an idea of what CEI is all about. A, a little more nuanced, but for a short description, that's good. <laughs> good, good. Uh, finally, welcome back to the show, uh, Lisa Baradkin. Uh, Lisa is an intellectual property litigation and new media attorney in Los Angeles, and a great friend of the show. Uh, It's great to see you again, Lisa. You too, Evan. Happy Friday. Greetings from sunny Central District of California. (laughs) That's great. Yeah, we do have a a coast-to-coast show today. We've got Ryan in Washington, D.C., and uh, Spencer uh, and I are here in Chicago, and then you are Bringing out, uh, bring it out there on the West Coast. So yeah, it's truly, uh, truly uh, a nationwide, a nationwide effort today. So, but yeah, there is still the, you know, there is the real Chicago theme. We were talking about this a little bit before the show. Uh, you know, Lisa, you're originally from here, right? You grew up here, and uh, that's Ryan, right. What, I'm from Libertyville. That's right, representing the uh, northern suburbs. Then right, big and, time. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, Ryan, you went to to Northwestern. And uh, like I said, of course, Professor Waller and I are, are here in Chicago. So it sounds like, you know, we ought to be sitting around talking about the Blackhawks or, or something like that instead, right? <laughs> so, but uh, instead, uh, let's talk about a few uh, legislation, regulation, and uh, policy issues. So as you know, the vast majority of people in the universe, in the world, are not experts on antitrust, uh, these competition regulation issues. So it's wonderful that we have a panel like this to uh, talk about some of these uh, some of these issues, some of these nuances. And of course, the big news story for the last couple of weeks has been the Comcast Time Warner uh, merger. Uh, so Professor, uh, Professor Waller, I'd like to, to talk to you first about this. You know, from time to time in the news, we hear stories of big corporations, big service providers or big producers of, of whatever, big participants in the market, uh, two, two or more of those coming together 
uh, for a merger um, on the scope of something like this. Could we just start from a very general level and help us understand how we should start thinking about the relevant issues to unpack when we hear a news story about two big companies coming together like this? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so we're sitting in 2014 and um, this is the 100th anniversary of the Clayton Act, which is one of the two big antitrust laws, the Sherman Act and the Clayton Act. And in 1914, Congress passed a law um, that made uh, mergers unlawful if they have a tendency, not, not an actuality, but just a tendency to substantially lessen competition or ten tendency to um, uh, create a monopoly. And 100 years in, we don't look at size, we look at power. So in general, we look at the relevant market the firms compete in and their effect on consumers and competition. And so uh, it, it's not really just the, the size. For example, th there are enormous corporations. Chrysler is huge, but it doesn't have a great deal of power. You wouldn't worry too much unless uh, they merged with General Motors or Ford or something like that. So in, in this case, uh, large mergers above $200 million get reported to both the Justice Department and the FTC. Uh, they decide among themselves which one will review it, and then they apply the Clayton Act uh, that, that I just described. They get some filings from the companies, and then they almost always, in a merger that has any serious potential for harm, uh, file what's called a second request where they ask the companies for a huge amount of uh, documents, and then they begin to run a very full investigation of the market. So that, that's the process. That's a little bit of the substance. Uh, in the area of media mergers, it's uh, one level more complicated because in addition to the antitrust review, there's a review by the Federal Communications Commission that uh, looks at competition issues and also looks at a broader kind of public interest standard. But those are the two things that are going to go on in this merger. How do you go about measuring the power that's at stake here. I know you made a distinction between size and, and, and power when it comes to the analysis here. How, what, what kind of factors go into thinking about the power of the parties yeah. involved? Well, there's two things going on. Um, there's two sets of crystal balls going on. The government um, uh, it has to get a crystal ball because in these cases, the parties can't merge. They can't finish the deal until the antitrust review has been complete. Um, so the government's predicting what is the likely, not the inevitable, but the likely uh, effect of, of this merger. And then uh, the parties have some uh, opportunity to put get out their crystal ball and say, no, 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 that's not right. Entry is easy. There might be some efficiencies. There are other things you ought to consider. But the government has that first uh, crack at it and has that first obligation to look into the future and figure out what's likely to happen. So what is power? Power in the law is the power to raise price or the power to exclude competition. It can be either one of those. So, uh, Ryan, how do you approach thinking about um, the, these issues when you when you first hear stories of, of large um, mergers, uh, large corporate transactions taking place? What's the first thing that goes through your mind and when you start doing an analysis of you know applying the expertise that you have and the perspective that you have to, to situations like this? Well, it's actually fairly similar to Professor Waller's analysis. Any deal that exceeds that two hundred million dollar threshold, among others is likely going to be subject to some degree of antitrust scrutiny. Uh, of course, when there is a transfer of wireless licenses, the Communications Act empowers the Federal Communications Commission to review the deal as well. So uh, at any time one of these big telecom media mergers is announced, what I tend to look at is first, what sort of relevant markets might exist, how might the transaction increase the share of of, of, a, of the merged entity in that market, and if so, how is that likely to affect consumer welfare? Uh, then there's the, the political side of things, which is especially relevant as far as the Federal Communications Commission is concerned. Uh, the, there's a longstanding scholarly uh, debate over what exactly the public interest standard means, but I think it's fair to say, regardless of what you think it should mean, we don't really have a good understanding of what it means, as in the courts haven't articulated it. So the FCC's uh, discretion here is much more whatever three of the five commissioners think it is. Whereas on the antitrust side, there is uh, there, there is uh, decades of precedent regarding what sort of conduct is anti-competitive under the, the Sherman Clayton Acts. Uh, although that that um, uh, precedent is is not as well fleshed out in all areas. So one thing that, that was interesting in, in this merger, the Comcast Time Warner Cable deal, uh, as we'll get into, is is that it raises some, some competition issues that 
involve buyer power, which we don't have a, as much of an understanding of as to how the courts might approach it. So the question is, what will the agency, what will the FCC, what will the Justice Department, which is, I think, likely to, to uh, be the one taking the lead on this deal, to do uh, in the coming weeks and months? Of course, there's going to be lots of money spent by uh, all sides of this, companies that, that support the deal, namely the two merging entities, companies that oppose the deal, and lots of public interest groups, nonprofits on all sides of the issue. So there's going to be a, 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 a sort of a, scout, a scholarly fact-based academic debate that goes on, and there's going to be a lot of money thrown around and political considerations that influence this as well, uh, both of which are, are interesting, uh, depending mm -hmm. on which side of the, of the, the game you're interested in or both. Sure. Uh, Professor, let's go back and, and make sure we've got things sorted out. Uh, again, you know, this is for uh, the, the, the listener, the viewer of the pro program. You know, it's comprised mostly of certainly consumers and content producers and business people, entrepreneurs, practicing attorneys who don't uh, deal with, with antitrust issues. But we certainly all participate in the, in the marketplace here. And uh, from a general uh, just public participation perspective, we're, we're interested in these things. Let's make sure we sort out what governmental powers or what governmental agencies are at work here, what laws they're applying and what their relative interests are. So you mentioned that the Department of Justice uh, would be playing a role as well as the Federal Trade Commission uh, as well. Is that right, Professor? Um, partly. Uh, when big mergers uh, are filed, the companies file their applications and their deal documents with both the FTC and the Justice Department. In the real world, only one of those agencies reviews it. Given that the Justice Department reviewed the prior uh, Comcast NBC Universal deal, it's it's almost a 99%, as Ryan said, that they will also be the agency that does the antitrust review on, on this oh. new merger. So okay, it's, and it's Go ahead, so basically, go ahead. what you're going to find uh, as we continue the conversation is Ryan and I probably agree uh, on the description of how the law works and what people do. And then we come from a very different normative place. I run an institute that looks at these issues of antitrust and regulation and um, from a sort of a consumer side perspective. But um, in terms of what happens, yeah, the um, uh, antitrust division of the Justice Department is broken up into various uh, sections that specialize in industries or occasionally one part of the antitrust laws. So th there's a section in the Justice Department, I don't remember the name of it, that handled the prior merger that almost certainly is going to handle this merger. They will assign a team of lawyers, paralegals, and, and in-house economists to look at all the deal documents, figure out what additional information they want from the companies. They will talk to customers. They will talk to competitors. They will listen to anyone else. But it, it, it's not a lobbying analysis within the antitrust division as much as it is a legal and economic analysis as to what they think the probable effects of this deal will be. And they're looking for any substantial indication that this is going to raise price, uh, reduce service, limit innovation, or otherwise adversely affect um, anything that uh, consumers – and, and, and suppliers and, and uh, customers uh, care about in this industry. And so they'll be applying uh, the, the Clayton Act? Is that, what, uh, is that what we need to be looking at here? Yeah, and that's the 100-year-old statute that I started to talk about before. Um, the law really has developed since 1950. There's older case law that says any deal that produces a, a combined firm with more than 30% of a relevant market, you got to fight about what that is. Uh, at least uh, the old cases say that's presumptively illegal. Um, but right now, that's really just the starting place for the analysis. The government starts with these numbers. What's the relevant market? Where do these companies compete or uh, act as supplier um customer relationships. They look at issues. Um, if it's horizontal competition, they're looking at how big is the market share? Uh, what is the efficiencies, if any? What is the likely harm to competition? If it's a vertical uh, merger, which this is also in part, uh, they will look at the effect on upstream and downstream. And they're making, they're getting out that crystal ball I talked about. Uh, because in the end, they got to do one of three things. They can either say, okay, go ahead and merge. Uh, they can say, we will go to court and oppose this, uh, or they'll often say, and that, that's what's happened frequently in the past, that we'll go to court unless you change the deal in particular ways. So it's important for the audience to, to realize is the, despite a lot of loose talk in the papers, the antitrust division and the FTC and other deals, those agencies don't block mergers. What they say is we're gonna go, go to court. They have to convince a judge that uh, the law that we've been talking about is likely to be violated. 
Can you think of some similar situations in the past that would help illustrate how this could turn out if the uh, Department of Justice were to, to to go to court? Does this look like any transaction that has played out that way uh, in, in the past that people would know about? Oh, sure. There, there's um, uh, This happens all the time. The, just, the agencies get thousands of deals. Well over 90 percent are cleared without any substantial investigation within 30 days. Uh, five, six percent get this so-called second request where the government needs a lot more documents to figure out its position. But then we're talking about maybe a couple dozen deals a year where the agencies say, we have a serious concern. Let's sit down and negotiate what would take away our concern. Um, and then there's just a tiny number of cases where they go to court and actually challenge it. Recently, the government challenged the AT&T acquisition of T-Mobile, which was abandoned. And earlier than that, uh, when Comcast purchased NBC Universal, they raised serious competition issues and the parties worked out an extremely complicated consent decree that will be relevant to what they do in this case. And we can talk about the details of that, but, but that's one deal that they blocked and one deal that they let through with conditions. And they're just hundreds and hundreds of deals that are the paperwork is filed and the parties go ahead and close their transactions shortly thereafter. Last week, Professor, you were on Chicago Tonight, you know, a, a news program on, on local television, you know, talking very uh, informatively about this. And, and I think that you said something there that would indicate that you think that's, that may be what happens in this situation here, right? A, a very complex agreement, uh, you know, is, is struck. Uh, you know, I think you said something like a year from now, that's, that's the perspective we'll be seeing on that. Am I getting that right? Uh, time frame, yeah, that sounds about right to me. Uh, the, the Justice Department um, may not have even gotten this required filing yet. I don't know uh, whether the parties have prepared that or submitted it, but whenever they do, it's not a surprise that they undoubtedly have informed the Justice Department beyond the media reports. So the DOJ will get that. Uh, a second request, which is like a gigantic administrative subpoena, uh, will go out. And the deal is then put on hold while the DOJ completes its investigation. In the real world, that's five, six, seven months. And throughout that process, they'll be having conversations with the parties, both about producing uh, the evidence that they want. And, and as they begin to formulate their position, uh, they'll start talking about what deals would uh, render render it acceptable if, if there are any. So yeah, I right. would expect by the, by the end of the year, you'll know the Justice Department's position um, I, there, I think there's some grounds for concern that we can get into in the discussion. Um, but uh, I think there'll be a constant back and forth about whether a new consent decree will emerge that will extend the basic framework from the old one. Ryan, what um, what's the FCC's relative role then, the interest that it will be bringing to the, the analysis as opposed to the Department of Justice? Well, the FCC certainly will and, and can consider consumer welfare in its assessment of the deal, but it also will likely consider other factors like how this deal might affect uh, minority uh, ownership of media, localism. Uh, there are a whole host of, of factors that the, that the FCC could use. It's worth noting uh, that the AT&T and T-Mobile merger that the Justice Department sued to block was actually uh, going to court. Uh, the AT&T filed its, its reply in the, in the District of uh, Columbia District Court. It was, it was seemingly ready to fight out an, an antitrust case that would have probably produced a, an interesting result either way. But then a couple months after the DOJ sued to block the deal, the FCC announced, this was back during uh, Chairman Jedkowski's tenure, that it too would seek to stop the deal. The difference is when the FCC seeks to do that, the remedy is not to go to a uh, an Article Three federal court uh, under, the, under the Communications Act. Rather, it goes to an administrative law judge who works for the FCC, then to the full commission, that is the five commissioners, and only then uh, does a, uh, a, a an entity that's engaging in a license transfer uh, have the ability to get review from a federal court. So it was only after the FCC, too, decided to seek to stop the deal that at and T-Mobile backed out. So in this case, it'll be interesting to see if both the, the, the Justice Department and the FCC try to block the deal or just one of the two. Uh, from my vantage point, because of the competition issues that, that we, we can discuss in a moment, I think it's probably somewhat more likely that the FCC will act because uh, the, the case to be made against this deal on an antitrust side, while certainly not uh, not crazy, not, not meritless, is not as robust as it was in, say, the AT&T and T-Mobile situation. The FCC, however, 
uh, although I, I don't expect it to, to try to block the deal, uh, would be able to have has the means to do so in a way that is from uh, the perspective of a Comcast or a Time Warner Cable more worrisome. Uh, so that's sort of how it's likely to play out over the next few months is we'll see uh, the, these two different uh, sets of uh, agencies evaluating this deal under two different frameworks, uh, both of which are, are not only substantively different, but procedurally different. Uh, but they Good. also they, are, they also talk to each other, Evan. They work closely together so they don't waste their time and and, and duplicate effort. But uh, they have completely different standards, as uh, Ryan's talking about. Great. Yeah, I mean, they're tasked with different things, so that would that would make sense, right? That they that they do different different things to approach it. Yeah, both sides are very sophisticated. Uh, they share a lot of common analytical frameworks, but the SEC has much, much mm -hmm. broader powers, as we've been talking about. Good. Well, you know, I don't want to hold back this this conversation anymore. I've been trying to just lay some groundwork here of how it'll work procedurally and what the what the law is to all this. Uh, you know, what law applies to all this and helps us understand it and 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 you know, imagining where it's going to go here. But let's talk about these competition issues here that uh, uh, you know could be controversial in our in our conversation here. So, Professor Waller, good or bad this deal? <laughs> Uh, troublesome. I'm not sure it's it, it, it's good or bad, but it, it raises serious antitrust issues. But it's a complicated case, and you know this is going to be less controversial show than you might have envisioned because Ryan and I probably agree on most of these things. Uh, I agree with his characterization that it's it it raises much harder issues to wrap around than AT and T, T Mobile. Uh, let me just back up on that deal and why the Justice Department charged ahead, um, and we never got a resolution. So in that market, uh, consumers you know buy cell phones. And both companies competed in, in, in most of the big cities. And when you merged them together, they took out a player. So in many markets, you went from four to three, three to two, five to four, uh, whatever. And in, in many cities, when you combine those two companies, you had a very, very high market share. And it, uh, cell phones are a, a difficult industry to, to, to enter. So you couldn't count on, on, on brand new options popping up in, in 50, 60 new cities. Um, in addition... AT&T and T-Mobile competed in the nationwide market for large corporate and government contracts. And so that merger <clears throat> conceivably could have impacted competition in both of those markets. So now cut to the deal and cut to what we're talking about today. Um, right now, these two companies don't compete directly for consumers in any city or very many cities that I'm aware of. That, that seems don't. to be a point that people really try to try to drive home, right? That that there are different markets, there's not a single customer that they're that they're competing over. That 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 seems like it would be really relevant. Uh, it's it's highly relevant. It's not a particularly good thing that you don't have a choice of cable companies, um, but it exists and this deal isn't going to make it any worse in the short term. So you don't have this direct overlap where uh, you know today uh, there are two or three companies fighting for your business and tomorrow there'll just be one less. You have the same number. Uh, if, if you're a Time Warner company, then the name of your cable company will change, but uh, you, you'll still have the same cable company. There is a nationwide market, though, where they do compete, um, and, and their competition could be affected in that. So they buy content, they distribute content, they do business with uh, internet backbone uh, companies. Uh, and, and so in that sense, this nationwide market is consolidating. Uh, the merger will produce an entity that has approximately 30% of all customers nationwide for phone service, um, for cable service, um, and, and approximately 50%, if I understand it right, for customers who buy a bundle of, of, of the three uh, of, of internet um, cable and phone together. So the concerns are a little bit different. They're more vertical rather than horizontal. Uh, for example, um, cable companies buy content. And so this combined entity will be in a position to both throw its weight around as a buyer in buying content and because it's also a content provider. Comcast uh, produces programs. They acquired a vast amount of programming when they bought um, NBC Universal. Uh, Time Warner has some content as well. Uh, they're in a position of both being a competitor and a supplier and a distributor for other people's content. And that's terrifying for a number of uh, uh, companies, particularly the Netflix of the world, uh, movie studios that depend on them to uh, as the pipe in, into people's homes. So those are some of the issues. And then uh, the other way around is when they're uh, uh, Comcast and, and Time Warner are uh, selling content, uh, distributing content, uh, they may favor it versus um, the distribution of uh, some of their other custom of the other uh, competing cable systems. So those are the concerns. And those are harder. Those are much harder to wrap um, antitrust around. When there are, you know, three cement companies in the country and two of them merge, mm -hmm. that's pretty easy. And you can come up with a, 
you can come up with a pretty easy remedy. It's much mm-hmm. harder to wrap your heads around this sort of buyer-seller relationship and come up with a remedy that will preserve competition. The Justice Department, as I mentioned before, in the earlier deal, let the deal go through, but imposed some conditions, primarily what they call the um, both net neutrality and non-discrimination provisions, so that for a certain number of years, the combined Comcast NBC Universal is not allowed to favor its own distribution or its own content, and they establish some kind of cool, actually, but complicated uh, arbitration provisions if uh, somebody thinks they're getting screwed, basically. Yeah. I like the cement company example. It's a rock solid uh, <laughs> analogy. Thank you. Um, Ryan, what, what do you see as the big concerns? Well, I completely agree that it doesn't matter that for purposes of this discussion, that most people in the country have two wireline providers for, for broadband and television. Uh, if you imagine a situation where, say, there were three wireline providers nationwide, and, and this deal would result in Comcast being one of those three everywhere in the country, but no more than one, from a competition perspective, that would be actually slightly more concerning because that would be 33% rather than 30%. So the relevant market here, or at least the way to start looking at this is the side or Comcast is buying content for now mainly on the television side where it's buying uh, content from the broadcast uh, stations in each local market along with nationally cable networks from companies like Time Warner, which own, which is distinct from Time Warner Cable. Time Warner owns uh, TNT, uh, TBS, a number of other companies. Then there are uh, a lot of other big players in this market. You have um, uh, Viacom, of course, which owns uh, uh, Comedy Central, uh, VH1, MTV, and a lot of Nickelodeon. You have uh, uh, Walt Disney Company, News Corp, uh, CBS, Hearst Corporation, Scripps Networks, and AMC and Discovery Communications, among many others. So from the perspective of competition, it's really the that side of the market, the nationwide market for selling content to television providers, where there is the, the potential argument. Uh, for uh, although the potential for a decrease in uh, in competition by the increase in Comcast share. So today Comcast has roughly 22 million television subscribers subscribers nationwide. After this deal, that number would go up to about 30 million of 100 million. Uh, so that, that's a that's a market increase. There's no doubt about that. Whether a, a content provider, a programming vendor that is, should be terrified. Maybe not quite, I wouldn't even maybe use quite such a strong word, but certainly concerned that their leverage might decrease. Now, there, there's well, there's a couple of issues here. First, that increase from 22 to 30 it, it is, not, is not an insignificant increase. However, right now, if you look at uh, the, the level of concentration in the market for television, you have a market that is unconcentrated, uh, at least according to the framework that the antitrust agencies use, the, the Herfindel Hirschman Index. Uh, you have you have an, an HHI under 1,500 after this deal. If, if you just look at the market for nationwide content and you assume all content providers are competing against each other, that number after this deal would increase to slightly above 1,500, which would make it a moderately concentrated market, which is not by any means an automatic rejection, but it, it you can make the case that it raises some concerns. However, uh, there's also the challenge of whether it's a bad thing or a good thing for consumer welfare, for programming costs to be facing greater pressure from the uh, the multi-channel video programming distributor. That's uh, that's the technical term that is used sometimes to refer to a, a cable company, a satellite company, or a, a fiber company that is delivering video. The if you look at the price history of television over the last uh, decade and and, and longer. Uh, Cable television bills and satellite television bills go up every year by a rate that almost always exceeds inflation by several percent. And the main reason for that is because programming costs are going up. Of course, the, the programming creators are investing a big share of that in producing more uh, expensive programming, which consumers like. On the other hand, consumers don't like their rates going up. So the question is, if Comcast, after this deal, can put more leverage on the company selling it content, even if that might be somewhat harmful to the content companies themselves, is it harmful for the overall welfare picture? I think it's far from clear, and I think it's actually unlikely that that it is. Uh, and even if it is, it's probably very, very minor because at 30% 
it's still far from the level where you can really act as, as, a, as a dominant player and really force the prices down dramatically on the margin Comcast might be able to. Then there's the other issue, which is, um, of course, Comcast is competing against the, the, the networks with its, its ownership of, uh, of NBC Universal. But that market for content is, uh, albeit not uh, extremely unconcentrated, somewhat unconcentrated, it's, it's not clear that, that this merger would let Comcast significantly crowd out the other creators of programming in the market for, for uh, video. So then, so that's the side of what could this mean from from a negative perspective for consumer welfare. Then the other side is what's the positive pro-competitive side of this deal. Now you always hear economies of scale, efficiencies, and so forth. Uh, to to make that a little more concrete for for folks who deal with these companies, Comcast or Time Warner, uh, my understanding, uh, and this data will certainly be be flushed out over in coming weeks and months. But for, for in general, Time Warner Cable offers a lesser product on the broadband side than Comcast does. In most markets, Comcast is offering uh, higher throughput con connectivity uh, per dollar spent. So if I were currently a Time Warner Cable subscriber, which I'm not, I'm actually a Comcast subscriber, I would, I would be um, somewhat happy that uh, Comcast were buying my cable company. Sure, I may not like I I I either cable company, but at least Comcast uh, in, in part because of its scale and in part because of its uh, its vertically integrated structure, which allows it to to uh, earn profits that other pure infrastructure providers can't, can, has built a network that is better than that of many other cable companies. So that's the potential benefit of this deal, that for the 8 million subscribers who will be bought out, uh, whose cable company will be bought, they could end up with a better broadband product and they could end up with with a television product that where programming costs are increasing at a lower rate. The question is, does this uh, is this sufficiently troubling on net when you take those two considerations among others to merit uh, uh, the Justice Department suing and a, a federal court ultimately blocking the deal? I think it's unlikely. Of course, uh, data as as data is is analyzed, uh, the the price behavior of of buyers in this market for content that may change. That, that analysis may be uh, more complex, but for now, I don't see a, a very good argument that this deal is on net sufficiently harmful to competition to justify intervention, especially, of course, when we recognize that uh, anytime you block a merger, there's a serious risk of a false positive where you 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 prohibit a pro-competitive deal because we don't know exactly how to evaluate uh, the, the future. So given the presumption that I, that I think uh, has been employed by a number of courts that when in doubt, uh, you probably want to let a deal go through, along with the clear benefits to consumers here. Uh, I, I think it's probably a good thing, and and thus will probably succeed on the antitrust side. Professor, in Professor. your opinion piece in the uh, Chicago Tribune, you said that this deal has the potential to do a variety of mischief down the road. Uh, does that you know? Does that kind of assertion do anything to respond to what to what Ryan said there about um, about the effect of this thing? Well, the Tribune gave me a total of 400 or 450 words to talk about <laughs> that, so so I didn't have a chance to get into the details or even address the efficiency arguments that the, the defendants uh, are, are going to articulate that, that Ryan did a nice job of, of, of explaining. So uh, to respond, first of all, Ryan and I come from a slightly different place. There's, there's a huge body of research that suggests that uh, large mega mergers between roughly equal firms, particularly stock deals, are, are just a recipe for disaster for shareholders, for customers, for everybody. And that just the efficiencies that are often uh, thrown out there. And again, this is sort of the other side of the crystal ball. The, the, the firms are saying, oh yeah, trust us, if the merger goes through, it's gonna be great for all these reasons. The, the history is um, they don't often get realized. And you know, AOL Time Warner is one of the classic examples that was supposed to produce all kinds of efficiencies, which is a disaster for everyone concerned, even on the company and shareholder side. So it, it, it's not that I'm against efficiencies. I think they're great uh, when they're uh, truly provable in advance. Uh, they should be considered very heavily by the by the government. And it's possible if you're a Time Warner customer, some good things may come out of this, albeit at a higher price. If you're, um, my intuition is that even if they get some better service, it will be paid for by higher fees by existing Comcast users and the use of leverage and buying power to sort of uh, drive better terms with uh, the companies that the combined entity will do business with. Um, 
from the consumer side, and Ryan's talking a lot about consumer welfare, but not actual consumers. Um, you got to ask yourself, uh, are, are you getting better service and are you getting better prices? Another way of saying is if the company saves any money, if they do, um, are they passing it along? Is it from the fact that they're better at their job or just that they're uh, the bigger company that's able to push around their customers and their suppliers? And those are all questions that is going to be decided by a huge amount of public of privately available confidential information the government will have that uh, I'll never see and Ryan will never see and uh, will only know what the p final position of the agencies are. So uh, efficiencies are, are, are easy to forecast but are hard to realize. Here's the problem. When you complete this merger, you will have a large vertically integrated entity that produces content, distributes it, provides phone service, provides internet service. And it will make it very difficult for even better, more efficient companies who are not as integrated to compete. So for example, if you're only a content provider, you must work out a deal to Comcast. You do not walk away from 30% of the customers for your content. If you are a, a competing um, uh, ISP or um, a cable company, you, you, you need content, you need uh, customers. And so I'll give you another example from a few years ago. Uh, Live Nation and Ticketmaster merged. Live Nation is the largest at the time uh, promoter of concerts, manager of talent, and, that, and, and controlling arenas. Ticketmaster was the largest uh, ticketing service in the country. And you created this vertically integrated company so that if you were an independent concert promoter, you needed to do business with one of your biggest competitors in order to book arenas and get ticketing services and et cetera. And, and again, it raises these exact same issues of open access, not free access, but just open and equal and non-discriminatory access uh, that I think are going to come up in the future when this deal goes through. Now, as a matter of prediction, I don't think they're going to block it. I think they're going to sit down and negotiate and extend some more of the terms that currently require net neutrality uh, for a number of years and um, non-discrimination. Uh, my biggest fear is those terms expire in a few years, aren't enough now, and won't be enough uh, uh, at the end of the, the day for um, uh, customers and competitors to have an open market. You said those magic words, net neutrality, and, and we can't talk about this this issue without addressing the the, the question of, of net neutrality. This whole problem of content and the, the problem of the vertical market here that you're talking about, Professor, seems to be a lot like to, to have a lot of the same pain points that, that people have when they think about network neutrality, but it also seems a little bit different. Can you can you say a little bit more about how network neutrality plays into to, to the analysis and, and to the question on, on this point? Sure. One of the things that the FCC brought to bear um, that's a little bit different than, than the Justice Department is they imposed the condition in allowing the NBC um, Comcast merger to go through is that the companies agreed uh, to so-called net neutrality, that they would not um, discriminate or change or charge different fees based on the identity of the user. You can charge congestion pricing to everybody. Uh, you can charge volume uh, pricing plans to everybody. But for example, they couldn't... Um, charge more as an internet provider to Netflix versus uh, something else uh, or Google. And so uh, that's in place. That'll be there for a few more years. I, I think it runs through either 2016 or 2018. Uh, and uh, so with this merger, you, you have, in essence, even a larger share of internet service uh, provider that the combined companies would have. And I would assume that the FCC would seek, well, the companies have agreed that they'll be subject to the existing net neutrality rules. I imagine the FCC may try to extend them either in scope or in um, a number of years that is covered. Ryan, what's your, th what's your thoughts on, what are your thoughts on how network neutrality plays into this? I, I agree with Spencer's prediction. It plays into this because even though today the main situation where Comcast is buying content is on the video side, the whole idea of a television package that exists separately from your broadband is is going to become obsolete. It's it's a matter of of when, not if. Uh, we've we've seen over the past few years, cord cutting has has gone from a, a very small phenomenon to a, a non trivial one, and it will become, I think, bigger as the years go on. So the question is, a decade from now, will Comcast, uh, at least on the infrastructure side, simply be providing that commodity of here's the pipeline for you, the end user, to access information from the, the internet from Netflix, Google, Amazon, and so forth. 
Uh, or will it be doing more? Will it have deals say that uh, that a net that Netflix content doesn't count against your monthly usage cap, which uh, is currently 300 gigabytes uh, per per user. Uh, whereas, say, the a deal might not have such uh, treatment for content from uh, Hulu. That sort of market is is I think likely to emerge eventually, and of course. The net neutrality conditions would for, would postpone that at least in, in so far as Comcast is concerned, which which is why Comcast has actually volunteered to uh, I believe extend its commitment to net neutrality for a few years beyond what it's currently uh, promised to do during under the Comcast NBC U deal. So the the question that this raises is: Do we generally think that it's troubling for these arrangements to emerge? Uh, whereby a content provider arranges either an exclusive deal or some sort of special treatment with the la a last mile broadband provider, uh, or, or or do we think that that these sort of arrangements could be good? Of course, I think that they could be bad in some situations, but I think they they're more likely to be good than bad. And an important reason that's the case is because, to me, based on what we've seen over the past few years, the leverage, uh, a lot of this leverage, is held by the providers of content. So Netflix is has grown to the point where it's been able to uh, negotiate arrangements with uh, many many internet providers to get its content to their users uh, without having to traverse the public internet uh, or by by co in some cases co-locating Netflix data in, uh, near the ISP's users within the the last mile ISP's network. You have to ask yourself if you are a, a say a Comcast subscriber and you have FiOS as a competitor, which unfortunately not everyone does. But let's take that example. If Comcast and say Netflix get into a dispute that results in Comcast degrading Netflix, are you willing to switch to Verizon if Verizon has uh, a better agreement with Netflix? Uh, to me, the data would suggest, at least so far, the anecdotal evidence that consumers are much more interested in getting the data that they want than they are in having a cable company versus another broadband provider. Of course, the fact that there are only two wireline providers for now uh, colors this conversation, although we may see some wireless competition in the future. We may see Google Fiber take off, although those are both highly speculative. Uh, but the this idea that we should have a sort of a blanket ban on these ag agreements seems troubling to me. That's what the FCC tried to do, was, was shot down in some respects by the D.C. Circuit uh, uh, recently and is now revisiting. So a framework to, that, that to me that considers the nature of these agreements and the incentive and ability of, of each last mile provider to engage in harmful conduct is, is, is crucial. That's something that, that, for instance, the antitrust laws uh, consider, but the sort of condition that the FCC would seek to impose does, would not. It would, just as the Comcast NBC Universal deal was just a blanket ban on these sort of preferential arrangements, uh, if, if it were extended as part of this deal, I suspect it would also be a blanket ban. Uh, sort of a per se rule for this sort of conduct seems uh, unwise to me, uh, as, maybe, maybe uh, especially as applied to all last mile providers, but even as applied to Comcast. What's so bad, for instance, if, if Google wants to arrange a deal that allows uh, its uh, Comcast users to get Google content without counting against their usage cap, for instance. Uh, I don't see that as necessarily harmful. Uh, and and I would like to see those sort of arrangements play out before prescribing them uh, universally. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, 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 let's talk about that. That sounds like an invitation to, uh, to, to address that issue, Professor. What, what do you think of, of sure. Ryan's <clears throat> question? What's, what's so wrong with that? Well, I think the key is, uh, I don't remember if you used the phrase or if Ryan used it, um, the key is infrastructure. And we have a tradition that goes back 500 years that when you talk about infrastructure, which can be very traditional stuff like roads, um, waterways, a port, uh, people who control infrastructure are, are, are deemed common carriers. And they're uh, just this goes back to medieval times. Even innkeepers had to sort of take everybody at uh, whatever their posted rate was and not discriminate based on their identity, right? If you, if you need two rooms, you charge them for two rooms. Um, but uh, it, imagine a situation where some company owns a highway and also owns a trucking company. 
And then uh, the question is, what tolls are they going to charge? And where they're a common carrier, they have to charge everybody the same tolls, whether it's their own trucks or a competing truck. In a world where you do it on a case-by-case basis, uh, all of a sudden, uh, my trucks can't get on Ryan's Highway without paying a higher, a higher toll. And that, that, that's, the, that's the kindergarten version of what we're talking about you know, in this much more complex world where, where the FCC has to analyze this. So two things have come up, and we're talking about what's good policy, not necessarily just good antitrust law for this merger. Um, Net neutrality is the regulatory response to trying to keep infrastructure as a, as a common carrier. And in antitrust, we go one step further that if you control, control the infrastructure and you discriminate against a, a competitor with respect to access, we may impose a duty of access. We may impose triple damages if, or monopolization under what's called the essential facilities doctrine. And uh, the simplest uh, Example I can give you actually comes out of Europe and not the United States. Uh, there are a bunch of companies that for just history control a port. They also run a ferry service out of that port. And guess what happens every time a competing ferry service, whether it's more efficient or not, tries to get access, they can't get into the, they can't get into the docks, they can't get uh, terminal space, they can't use the, the port. And so um, I like to see a world where you combine the regulatory notion of um, – net neutrality and the antitrust notion of essential facility doctrine to keep infrastructure open. And it's really important because the point of infrastructure is people use it to create stuff downstream. And we don't know what's coming and we don't know who are going to be the winners and the losers of having um, broadband access. Uh, that can be um, uh, authors, that can be uh, scholars, that can be musicians, that can be uh, movie producers. And if you have net neutrality or something like it, you don't have to pick winners and losers. Everybody gets it on the same basic terms. They have to pay for it, uh, whatever they use. And then they, they, they win or lose in downstream, and society is often uh, very uh, much the better for it. That uh, I'm wondering, I mean, what you're, what you're talking about here sounds like they, the, the issues touch on some very serious concerns. And I've read some commentary that would suggest that a merger of this sort in the media context actually is a threat to free speech. Professor, is that overstating it? Uh, is that just being too grandiose in articulating uh, one, of the, one of the concerns that a reasonable person may have? Or is, uh, you know, how, how should we think about the idea that this threatens th free speech? Well, um, it, it, it's not a First Amendment issue, but um, it, it, it is a potential threat to people uh, who need any of these inputs, whether it's the content, whether it's internet access, to do what they do. And um, I like to think of it as uh, creative spillovers, as uh, we just don't know what's going to come out of all this. Um, but uh, yeah, to call that free speech, um, that's not where I go. I, I've seen those arguments. I, I understand what they're talking about, but but that tends to get you wrapped up more into mm -hmm. the, the bill, of, bill of Rights stuff that uh, just isn't applicable here. Right. Are you just as sensible on that issue, Ryan? Not to ask you a, a, a loaded, loaded question. <laughs> sure. So, of course, a company that has infrastructure could use it to stifle viewpoints it doesn't like. We, I participated in a, an amicus brief to the D.C. Circuit in the Verizon case, arguing, in fact, that uh, the net neutrality violates the First Amendment by compelling Internet providers to carry viewpoints with which they might disagree, uh, which could, could you could compare to... Uh, the, case, the Miami uh, Herald case where the Supreme Court held that uh, you cannot force a newspaper to carry uh, editorials by respondents that disagree with the newspaper. But in, in all likelihood, with the exception of sort of maybe a niche provider that wants to provide family-friendly uh, internet service, you're not going to see a major provider block viewpoints it doesn't like because that's bad business. Just as a lot of these major corporations try to avoid taking controversial policy positions on issues that don't really matter to them, your goal is not to alienate customers. Your goal is to make money, and the best way to do that uh, is to focus on the economic side. So there, there's there's much more merit to the concern that sort of this gatekeeper authority might be used to to uh, to leverage infrastructure uh, for for uh, super competitive profits than than the concern about free speech. Although I I don't think either concern is all that serious in this market. Professor, you said the Chicago Tribune gave you 450 words. You get more than that here. Why don't you put a cap on, on this for us before we uh, move on to uh, a topic other than this, uh, this merger deal? How do, how do we think about this? 
Well, you know, think of it from the point of view of a, a real consumer five or 10 years from now, um, as the industry further consolidates uh, whether this deal is allowed to go through or not, are they going to be better off? Are they going to get uh, more services at, at, at prices that uh, are, are better or worse than now? Uh, how fast is innovation going to proceed? Uh, are, are competing content providers going to be disadvantaged? And, and, and we have to predict the future. That's why merger cases are in general harder than a cartel case or a monopolization case where you have something that's actually happened and you, you simply analyze whether it's good or bad. Uh, this is an industry where, as Ryan points out, there are you know, essentially two wires into the home. One's a uh, um, on the uh, the cable side, and one's on the uh, historical uh, phone company side. Those industries don't compete all that vigorously. Uh, Susan Crawford has a terrific book about captive audience that, that, that talks about some of these issues. Uh, this merger isn't going to immediately uh, uh, reduce options for the consumer. You'll still have the same two wires. Um, but down the road, uh, how can we best make this market more competitive? I'm, I'm convinced that you want to keep infrastructure companies um, much more like the old-fashioned telephone or even the electrical grid. You, you, if, you're, if you control the pipes, you, you shouldn't control content. That's why this um, uh, merger is troubling to me. Uh, I'm just going to put on uh, my hat, not what I think should happen, but what I think will happen. I think there'll be hard negotiations. I think there'll be a consent decree that imposes continued conditions of non-discrimination uh, and, and conditions of net neutrality. The companies will be delighted to go forward on that basis. That makes me extremely concerned. Uh, the best arguments they have is that they have uh, some continuing and future competition with uh, um, <clears throat> the telecom companies, with Dish TV, uh, satellite TVs, and with eventually mobile. Some of that is true. Um, however, none of those things are exactly uh, fully um, reasonable alternatives. And the problem is, yeah, the media world is converging. But if you buy that basic notion that convergence is everything, that means you could let Comcast buy every single cable company and they'd still be making those arguments that the other industries uh, somehow constrain them. The evidence is it's a weak constraint and it's going to get weaker. Great. So Lisa, you're still with us, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Great. What, what do you think? I mean, uh, you know, for me, from my perspective, this has just really been a privilege to, to uh, be able to hang out with uh, Professor Waller and with uh, Ryan today to hear about all these things. Uh, what's, what kind of horse do you have in this race? What are your thoughts? What, what are your perspectives? Well, I, I have um, cable internet from Time Warner, and uh, I, I'm very concerned about the content discrimination. <laughs> I I represent a lot of content creators, a lot of homegrown so to, sort of a YouTube type content creators and just <laughs> at under the smell test. I mean the whole thing it just stinks. I mean I don't know why Comcast has to own NBC and Universal. They made this very short-sighted, very short-term agreement to keep the delivery of services neutral. I don't know why it has to end in 2017. I mean, it, it just seems sort of a priori evident that of course consumers are going to suffer. Of course there's going to be discrimination if they've explicitly agreed that after the expiration of that consent decree, they can throttle competitors like Netflix. So I'm very concerned about it and I, I'm very um, sensitive to the rhetoric that is being put out about defining the market in a very facile, one-dimensional way, just based, for example, on the remarks of Comcast CEO. He was only focused on the market for television, cable television subscribers, but he's not looking at the vertical layers of the bundled services. So yes, I am very um, keen to understand from Professor Waller and from Ryan, exactly what all of the foreseeable effects are on content creators as well as content consumers. I mean, for years I've sought to understand why it is that everyone just seems to accept that of course you want massive amounts of speed download, but upload everyone should be content with only a fraction of what you can pay for download. I mean, aren't our voice is also important. And I, I haven't seen anything that, that's trying to help people who are trying to start companies that rely on the ability to, to project a, a sort of a dissenting voice or a diverse voice. So I'm, I'm extremely concerned about the merger and I hope that 
if nothing else, um, it will provide a moment to to show everyone uh, the importance of net neutrality. Um, many other countries have it. It's it's something that's very capable of being passed as law, and um, I, I definitely hope that the the arguments um, ultimately are supported by hard data. Um, statistical evidence and, and history of how um, these giant media conglomerates have actually used their power in the past. Um, and I'm sure we're going to get into the Netflix throttling accusation story later in the show. But I, I just can't stress enough how important it is that um, we look at all angles of this story and not just um, at the the consumer market as passive recipients or viewers of cable television because the fact that it concerns our ability to communicate with each other and innovate on the internet and start businesses that depend on high speed output instead of just download um, i think that's all a very critical part of this conversation yeah i think those are some 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 great points and uh no doubt there'll be much more to happen uh as the story develops and as the different processes take place over the uh, over the next year so uh thank you thank you for those comments so um let's move on to another topic but before we do that uh my my the, the panelists stay take a quick uh relaxation break here let's take a moment to say thank you to uh, the sponsor of episode 247 of This Week in Law, Scotty Vest. I'm actually wearing a Scotty Vest uh, vest today. So my question for you is, how many pieces of clothing are actually engineered, not just designed, but engineered? Scotty Vest clothing is engineered with tons of pockets to make carrying and using your gadgets easy, comfortable, and discreet. We're fans of Scotty Vest. You can see that here because we carry a lot of stuff. We also love how you can wire a battery pack from one pocket into another to keep your electronics charged all day without being tangled. It's a lifesaver for Google Glass users too, I presume. I'm not so fortunate to uh, have been a Google Glass user yet. So if you can get the camera back on me, I'd like to just show, you know, I mean, I've got the, uh, I've got the vest on there, just tons of pockets in here. Like some of them I haven't even figured out how to uh, get into yet. You know, I can carry all my stuff. Of course, I got my cell phone, got, uh, you know, digital camera, just to give you a little demonstration of all the stuff you can carry in this, you know, uh, sunglasses, of course. I mean, I've got all the all the stuff that, you know, you need when you carry around, you know, to have uh, an effective, useful, uh, productive uh, life, all the tools that I use every day. So, you know, it's a, it's a great product. I can actually uh, say that. Uh, so Scotty Vest is more than just vests. They make high quality hoodies, jackets, shirts, pants, and other items for men and women to carry their gadgets and gear in style. They include a patented, this is interesting, personal area network or PAN, P-A-N, to keep your wires under control, perfect for battery packs, as we said earlier, headphones, especially at the gym. Uh, they're engineered with tons of hidden pockets that I showed you, essential to keep your cash, gadgets, and important documents safe, especially when you're travel. Now, this is a really important point. Uh, Scotty Vest actually has a pickpocket guarantee and will reimburse you up to $1,000 if you're pickpocketed while wearing your Scotty vest. So I thought that was interesting. Maybe you could put somebody up to, um, to picking your pocket. So, so over 10 million pockets sold and counting. Uh, in celebration of its 13th anniversary, Scotty vest is running a 40% off sale for 14 of their best selling items now through February 24th. So that deadline is approaching quickly. That's Monday. Uh, sale items include the men's and women's trenches, Scotty vests, new puffer jackets. I have one of those too. And it's amazing. It's like so warm even though it's thin and lightweight. Uh, fleece 7.0, cardigans, bamboo polos, performance t-shirts, and convertible travel pants, which can quickly change from full-length full length pants uh, to shorts. So visit scottevest.com slash twit. That's S-C-O-T-T-E-V-E-S-T dot com slash twit to check out the great Scotty Vest products that you can buy for 40% off during this sale. And be sure to use the promo code. Here it is. TWIT13, T-W-I-T-1-3 at checkout. 
That's Twit 13 for Scotty Vest's 13th anniversary. But you only have until 9 p.m. Mountain Time on February 24th, that's Monday, to take advantage of this incredible sale. If you're watching or listening to this late and missed the sale, be sure to check them out anyway and use the code. Scott Jordan from Scotty Vest said he would put up other great deals just for the Twit Army like you all. And they feature different sale items daily for 20% off. That's scottevest.com slash twit and use the code TWIT13 at checkout. We thank Scotty Vest for their support of Twill. All right, let's keep it moving on and, um, and talk about some privacy issues. All right, so I think this is pretty big news this past week. The Massachusetts Supreme Court held that um, the cops should have gotten a warrant before they obtained uh, cell site location information about a criminal defendant trying to figure out where he was at the time of a murder that he was suspected of. Um, you know, the, this this idea of of uh, cell phones, mobile devices being source, you know, big sources of, of information is is an important one. And in this uh, situation, this case here. Uh, the Massachusetts State Supreme Court recognized that a person has a, an expectation of, of privacy in data that happens to be stored by some some uh, one else somewhere else. Uh, Professor, uh, did you take a look at this, and, and what are your thoughts on on this uh, from your perspective? Sure, I, I took a quick look at it, uh, particularly a, an, an article that was on the National Review Online about this, and uh, it, it's a major step forward. There's two things going on here. First is this is a decision under the Massachusetts uh, state constitution and their equivalent of the Fourth uh, Fourth Amendment. So it wouldn't be binding on the federal courts and it wouldn't necessarily be adopted in any of the other states. This is a, a big step forward. Uh, this is among the few decisions that have said uh, that an that a individual has an, a reasonable expectation of privacy uh, with respect to data stored by a, a non-governmental entity. And so – well, that's very different. So the U.S. Supreme Court about a year ago said that uh, the federal government needed a warrant with respect to or, or any state would need a warrant with respect to putting on a, a tracking device, a GPS on a drug dealer's car. But there the, the, the information was being gathered by the government, not a private um, private entity. So I, I applaud this decision, um, but it's a it's a major step forward. And I don't know enough about all 50 state constitutions um, and my best guess is this won't spread widely outside of Massachusetts, but it's definitely a, a step in the right direction. And in my prior life, I was a, a assistant U.S. attorney, and we had to get uh, warrants for, for a wide variety of things. And um, it's just not that hard. You just have to demonstrate probable cause. And it's a proceeding where you go into a judge. There's nobody on the other side. You have an affidavit and sometimes an agent or a police officer to support your application. Unless the judge really sees something that smells, uh, he or she uh, grants the warrant and you proceed. So mm -hmm. it, it involves a, a little extra work and a little extra time. I'm delighted that they're going to have to do this in Massachusetts going forward. Right. Yeah. In this case, the uh, what they had done was gotten a, a D order, a, a, a an order under Section 2703D of the Stored Communications Act, the federal statute, to get this information from, I believe it was Sprint. Uh, and and so the court sort of is giving the government another bite at the apple here to say they remanded the case back to the trial court, allowing them another chance to put forth information whether there was probable cause. So in this particular case, this defendant uh, isn't necessarily walking free yet, and this information very well may be evidence, but uh, it, it, it is uh, important. And I think you kind of intimated it there that uh, Massachusetts does tend to be very pro-data privacy in, in some of its legislation. So uh, Lisa, what do you think of this decision? Oh, I agree. I think it is also a step forward, I think that uh, it's such a minimal requirement um, when you compare it to the magnitude of the type of information that um, law enforcement could collect regarding your whereabouts. Um, so I did appreciate the distinction that was being drawn here between the actual cell phone records and the location information that is collected and stored by the cell phone provider. So I hope to see more decisions like this in, in other states, even if they are only under state constitutions. Ryan, what do you think? I too am happy about the decision. Uh, federal appeals courts 
uh, so far have not given us much hope that uh, that that ultimately we will see cell site location information being protected by the warrant requirement. On the other hand, uh, the, the Jones decision, albeit relating to the physical attachment of a device to a car, showed that there is unanimity on the Supreme Court uh, about location tracking in some contexts, whether that extends to the compelled disclosure uh, uh, of information from cell phone companies it will be interesting to see. Um, I, I think that it's, it's helpful that the Massachusetts uh, Supreme Court looked at the distinctions between what's, hap what ha what's happening when the government forces a company to divulge location data from what was happening uh, in the, the classic case, uh, Smith v. Maryland, where the Supreme Court said that the Fourth Amendment does not impose a warrant requirement when the government obtains dialed number information, who you are calling on the phone. Uh, what the Massachusetts court explained was that, among other things, there's no uh, volitional disclosure of your location information with your cell phone uh, in the same way that you're typing in a dialed phone number to tell the phone company where to send your call. The fact that your cell site information is being collected in the first place is something that some people don't know about. Uh, and it's even though, of course, we all we, I think we all know that our cell phones are connecting to a tower where the tower is, what sort of information is being collected is it, it doesn't have that sort of volitional third party uh, uh, sharing that that motivated the Supreme Court uh, in, in the Smith case. Uh, although I have some skepticism about whether there's any good reason why sharing information with a third party uh, with a pri arrangement to keep it private should be exempt from the Fourth Amendment's warrant requirement. Uh, there, th there are some in interesting reasons why this is, uh, this is distinct, along with, of course, uh, uh, as Lisa explained, the, uh, the more uniquely invasive you know, privacy implications of uh, of the government being able to figure out where you've been and where you're you're going prospectively. Professor Waller, what the what the court did was take a look at you know from a different perspective, draw a different conclusion as to the third party doctrine, which was the which was articulated in those cases that you've talked about the was it Smith versus Maryland? Is that is that one of them? And then I know there's a Miller case that, that that does that as well. And what the court in Massachusetts did here was recognize that there is an expectation of privacy when that data is in the possession of a third party because of this volitional uh, element of it here. The they, they talk about how it's different than uh, bank records or you know, or phone numbers dialed where you know that you are providing that to to the third party. Your location information is just done involuntarily, so to speak. I mean, I think that is probably overstating it a little bit, but because of that, the court made a qualitative difference and said that the uh, that there is an, an expectation of privacy. Is is there a risk that though that there is there a risk that there is a slippery slope here that we're going down, especially with the evolution of technology? And if you think of where we may be in 20, 30, 50 years with all of the technology that may be integrated into our bodies, you know, Google Glass is just a harbinger of something like this. Won't someday all information be going somewhere else and, and involuntarily being disclosed so that third, do the third party doctrine is essentially eviscerated by this exception that, that the court seems to be articulating here? You know, the, the I'm not an expert on the Fourth Amendment. I'll, I'll leave that to my constitutional law and, you know, criminal procedure colleagues. The, the problem has always been the reasonable expectation of privacy that changes over time and that can cut both ways. And, you know, it's just uh, it, it, in general, uh, the reasonable expectation of privacy in a sort of subjective societal sense is less and less. We're all, we're all aware of how uh, little privacy we have with respect to information that's being generated by us or collected by others. So that could really cut the other way down the, down the road as um, uh, the, the more consumers become aware, the more people become aware of how much data is, is being drawn from us or provided by us could be used by a more conservative court to say anybody in the right mind w would have no reason to think that this is protectable from a government um, search or gathering. Lisa, have you given any thought as to whether if courts were to to take this position more broadly about the reasonable expectation of uh, what essentially is metadata here, it's information about where you were, it's not the contents of your communication. Have you given any thought as to whether this could affect any of the lawsuits, like particularly the one by Senator Paul against uh, the NSA for the collection <laughs> of, of, of metadata? What, what do you think of that? Is that just crazy talking? No, I mean, absolutely. I think what you're seeing is a convergence of a lot of scary 
entities that are sort of amassing power and amassing data all at once. Um, I think that it does, um, you know, it's only one of 50 states, but it does go into the overall social analysis and expectation of changing norms of privacy. Um, so I think these small victories for privacy are very important. Um, but, you know, think about what's been going on in the news lately. You know, if, if you can track people's locations and then you can also have drones do civilian attacks. I mean, it doesn't take much connecting of the dots to put together this dystopian possible future. Um, so all these little pieces, you need to sort of play them out into the worst case scenarios to understand why each of these small things um, becomes very critical over time. And so, you know, you have a precedent now in one of the states and, and if that's the only precedent there is, um, it's going to be useful, um, possibly, not necessarily per persuasive and that's certainly not binding, but on other states. And then, then if you have enough of these precedents, um, you know, the Supreme Court can look at them to sort of define what is society's expectation. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I realize that there are legal problems with the vehicle that Rand Paul's lawsuit is using, but the spirit of it is is quite legitimate and, and quite important. And, uh, you know, we should be generating a dialogue on whatever level we can to understand, you know, everyone wake up, you know, what's going on? <laughs> We're consolidating power in a few private enterprises and, um, you know, also bit by bit um, have the opportunity to shape privacy law going forward. So, so that's the connection I would make between this Massachusetts case and the Rand Paul lawsuit. You're using an interesting word reminded me that I do need to drop in a passphrase for those folks <laughs> listening for MCLE credit or other professional credit. Let's go with dystopia. And if you can spell that on the first try without uh, consulting a dictionary, whether it's I or Y at the beginning, I think you should get double credit, right? Does anybody, anybody agree? So <laughs> dystopia, the first MCLE uh, password, passphrase for episode 247 of, of This Week in Law. Ryan, last word on uh, privacy, cell site information, cell site location information, and uh, uh, the, the expectation of privacy. Well, we've all been talking about the courts, but it's worth noting that there is uh, there, are, there are several bills in Congress with bipartisan support in both chambers that would statutorily impose a warrant requirement on this sort of access that would extend, of course, not only the federal uh, federal law enforcement, but also to states as well. Uh, that's the that's one one bill is the GPS Act, supported by uh, folks like Senator Ron Wyden, uh, Mark Kirk, and uh, John Conyers, and and many others in both chambers. So we may see this resolved through a legislative vehicle, uh, such that the courts don't need to weigh. And that's what Justice Alito suggested in his uh, concurrence in in Jones that with some of these complex technical issues, it may be better for legislatures to set a floor that's uh, higher than the Constitution, so we don't have to rely on uh, on generalist judges to make these determinations for us. Great. All right. Well, let's move on now and talk about a, an interesting trademark issue. Lisa, you put this in the uh, rundown uh, for today. There's this ongoing trademark saga with King, uh, the, the, the maker of Candy Crush, uh, you know, with the, with the different things that are going on with, uh, with trademarks and, and their uh, conduct and activities, their uh, maneuvering. Tell us what's going on there, what, uh, what you saw interesting about this story. Oh, I, I thought this was kind of interesting um, just because uh, there's so much merger and acquisition activity going on in the news, and it, it sort of seemed to go along with the announcement that King, which is the gaming company that publishes Candy Crush Saga, um, has filed um, for an intended IPO. Uh, I don't know what they're going to do with all that extra money. I don't know why they would want to invite all of the SEC oversight, but be that as it may, um, you know, they're making tons of money on this game, Candy Crush. Um, but it has a, a slight trademark issue um, with a pre-existing um, casual game, smartphone game called Candy Swipe, which functions very similarly um, from what I've read uh, to Candy Crush Saga. Um, and so for those of you that don't know, um, the story is basically that this um, smaller 
uh, game publisher um, published some sort of open letter and, and trademark opposition to Candy Crush Saga, claiming um, confusion among the public uh, as to the source of their um, it, it, in, in the gaming world, I guess it's called uh, lining up three or swipe or, or lining up three of the same um, candy. Well, anyway, the game mechanics are somewhat similar, uh, but they did have priority in terms of the date that they had applied for the trademark. Um, so initially, uh, King had published an open letter saying that they didn't want to sort of overstep their bounds or impinge on other game makers. Um, but then interestingly, uh, sort of around the time that they seemed to have been getting ready for their uh, initial filing for the contemplated initial public offering, uh, they acquired another game publisher that had a casual game under the name Crush Candy or Crusher Candy. It's in, it's in the show notes. Um, and now that they have amended their response um, in the trademark office to claim prior use, um, because I found it to be somewhat disingenuously represented, but basically what they said in this amendment to their trademark office filing was, well, it's come to our attention that uh, – the, there is a prior use of a of a smartphone game with candy in the trademark, and we happen to own the assets of this company. So we've owned the assets of this company, and we want to claim prior use. Um, so basically, it's one of these stories about a little guy getting sort of pushed around by a big company. But it does raise interesting issues about the nature of trademark law and the need to protect your mark or protect your territory and, and sort of the public policy reasons about it. Um, I talked to a friend of mine, uh, Rocky Rawls, uh, yesterday, who actually was my boss when I did the Starbucks work that we were talking about last week with the dumb Starbucks editorial. And I asked him what he thought this and he said, well, really, it it doesn't help you because um, you you can acquire the assets of another company and you can acquire the mark. But if if you didn't use the mark for a similar good or service, it, it's not going to help you retro actively. So anyway, I thought that was kind of an interesting story. But I, I think this goes to show sort of that when you are accountable to shareholders, you're going to make business decisions that are defensible in terms of what affects your bottom line. And you may mean well, you may like to be a good member of the gaming community, but if what your shareholders expect is to produce value and beat competitors, you may do something like this. And I do definitely see correlation between this apparent about face by King in its trademark policy and the filing of the IPO documents. It, it seems to be that people seem to think that King is acting a little bit trollish here. Wouldn't you agree that they, they recognize this problem? So then they go acquire rights that, um, you know, got rights from somewhere else to then try to uh, make a superior showing in a, a, a trademark dispute. I mean, do you, do you agree, Lisa, that that's sort of the, seems to be the critique? I don't think anybody's calling them a troll in this, but is that something that seems to be rubbing people the wrong way on this? I do. Uh, the initial impression is one that does seem that it is a predatory move. Um, I, I mean, if you look at the quality of King's game and the quality of the game that they're supposedly competing with and the quality of the game that they acquired. I mean, they're, they're nowhere near in the same type of category. Like, I don't think a customer would think that they came from the same source. So this does seem predatory. And I, I do think it's interesting from a trademark perspective. I mean, why can't they be happy with the $1 million a day in cash that they make through the app store? <laughs> I, I don't know why that's not enough for them. I, I guess they're worried someone's going to cancel their mark. And if they do, so what? I mean, why don't they just make a non-confusing mark and, and just continue cashing in all that money? <laughs> right. What do you think, Ryan? Is there anything wrong with, with, with King's approach to maneuver with what trademark law may or may not allow uh, to, to try to get the most rights? I'm, I'm not familiar enough with this dispute to condemn it, but it it, it also it doesn't sit uh, entirely right with me either. I, 
I I don't see a uh, substantial likelihood of, uh, of confusion here, although I, I haven't played any, uh, either of the games at issue. But this, the, it, it, and it also seems somewhat, uh, you know, you might say a little, it looks a little like a troll, as you might traditionally consider it uh, in, in the in, in the patent context to buy up this this uh, trademark for this reason. So I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical uh, uh, as well. Professor, what about you? I mean, what do you see as a, a good use of, of trademarks in, in contexts like this, perhaps, you know, from a, from a consumer uh, interest standpoint? Well, uh, you know, I'll defer to Lisa as uh, you know, as 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 the working expert on this. Um, so I, I, it's hard for me to weigh in on on the specific dispute. The only thing I would notice is that um, of all the IP rights, trademark seems to have expanded the farthest, the fastest, uh, certainly in recent years. Uh, it, it's inconceivable when you sort of create the basic notion of trademark originally as just a uh, indication of origin and 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 and, and source uh, to get to the point where we're at today where it's a, a valuable form of property it's a foundation for branding and it, and in, in many industries it's probably more valuable than patents and copyrights so uh, in terms of how the consumer is is benefited or not it, it it's something that deserves a, a lot more attention and uh, it it spills over into my area a little bit brands can be a source of competitive uh, uh, power that can take advantage of consumers. Um, but uh, as to the specifics, I, I'm just not familiar enough. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting point. What do you think about that, that Lisa, the expansion of, of trademark law? Because I think this is an idea that is lost on people pretty, pretty often. The idea that trademarks really, uh, trademark law historically, traditionally has existed to protect the consumer so that they know the source of the particular product that they're, that they're purchasing here. Do you, uh, what would be your comment on the assertion that it has expanded and moved now more to protect the entity asserting the trademark rights, kind of having lost sight of, of the original intention to protect consumers? This reminds me of a thesis that the French semiotician Jean Baudrillard had put forth um, in the 1980s, which was- Let me stop you right there. With an introduction <laughs> like that, you could say whatever and we'd believe you, even if we haven't heard of any of that stuff. Oh, well then, of course, if it was French and he has a name like that. Okay, go on. I'm just trying to loosen up the mood here with all this doom and gloom. But uh, he posited that in the future, um, there'll be so much information and such an inundation of, of signifiers that the strength of a signal itself would have value in itself, not just what it was actually standing for, but just how strong it was. So logos in themselves have value. And uh, I think that in trademark law, it is absolutely true that it's not just what the logo is standing for, but how recognizable worldwide the logo is. And you see this all around the world. You'll see these logos in very unexpected places. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, trademark law, it, it's about protecting um, assets that are valuable as indicating the quality of a source. I mean, it's supposed to protect the consumer, but it also is supposed to reward the mark holder for having a good reputation. So I, I do think that it's one of those areas of law that uh, is only bound to become more significant and, uh, you know, some playfulness like we saw last week, but, uh, you know, it's, it's serious business. You wonder if it should uh, uh, expand or at least become a little bit more flexible because if you think of the way media is involving, and I'm thinking of disputes like um, the dish hopper, for example, that allow one to excise commercials from their media consumption experience. You know, where else then do brands get the opportunities to make themselves known except in the content themselves, which by its very nature, that sort of expansion would seem to necessitate a need for the expansion of, of what trademark rights are. It seems like there ought to be uh, uh, something like that there. Uh, let me ask again for the second time. Would something like that be crazy talk? Ryan, what do you think? No, I, I don't think that's that's crazy. I mean, as this content market evolves, we will we will certainly see, um, you know, the, the meaning of what it is to have a trademark change. But I'm, I, I, yeah, I also think that, that the Professor Waller's point about the, the this massive uh, expansion of trademark is interesting, especially in that, it's it's, it's it, unlike copyrighted patents. It's it's not mentioned in in the constitution. It's also not even it's not traditionally conceived of as as quite a a, a property right in rem 
uh, to the to the extent of patents and, and copyrights. Yet it's expanded quite a bit, which, which is interesting, uh, given that it, its purpose is is in some respects uh, more circumscribed than these other types of intellectual property. Well, very good, Lisa. Anything else you want to say about uh, trademarks? Oh well, not today. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a lot for today, but uh, I did enjoy the discussion. Good. The second MCLE passphrase for episode 247 of This Week in Law is aircraft. Aircraft is the second MCLE passphrase. So did you see that Dropbox changed its uh, terms of service and that there are some people who uh, find this to be of uh, interest? It looks there's a piece over on uh, Lawyerist by Sam Glover that uh, uh, was published yesterday on the on the 20th, highlighting that uh, uh, Dropbox amends its term uh, terms of service to add mandatory binding arbitration and also uh, no class actions. Uh, Lisa, let me go right back to you on this. Uh, what should we make of companies trying to uh, uh, constrain the rights of its users in this way? Oh, well, this um, came up a few years ago in the U.S. Supreme Court with uh, Concepcion versus AT&T, which was um, a case that had to do with whether um, the attempt in terms of service to outlaw or mandatory arbitration and class action waivers would violate the California Constitution. And the Supreme Court essentially said, no, it doesn't violate the California Constitution, even though we know that nobody reads those contracts anyway. They are contracts of adhesion, but too bad. Um, nothing will stop the states from putting more um, obvious disclaimers or making more conspicuous disclaimers um, in these kinds of contracts. Um, I do think, though, and I wanted to thank you um, and everyone else for spreading the news that you can actually opt out of the arbitration clause if you are, like I am, a Dropbox user. Um, and there's two points I would make about this. Um, one is a very practical one. Um, if you prohibit class actions, um, it, it does sort of um, make it so economically unequal that it, it would be impractical, I would think, to um, take any sort of legal action against a company. Um, class actions are designed to put together a lot of plaintiffs who don't have a lot of economic power um, and, you know, seek some sort of redress or, or force a change. And uh, one of the things that was in this revised terms of use is that you're not going to bring any private attorney general cases against Dropbox. So basically, you're agreeing that by using their service, you're not going to later claim, um, you know, some sort of, of power uh, that comes from aggregating um, the resources of, of enough individual users to make it worth some class action plaintiff's lawyer while to to bring a case. But on the other hand, it is a free service. And um, this is one of the basically waiting for the other shoe to drop type scenarios when you have free, quote, free things um, that are being offered to users. So eventually there has to be some limitation on the liability, I would imagine. Um, I don't see it as a problem. I think it's, uh, you know, it's a great service. It's, it's a market leader in what it does. Um, in general, the idea of class action waivers is troublesome, but the Supreme Court has said they're they're okay. Um, so anyway, I, I do think that you have to take it with a grain of salt, and, and I understand that there are barriers to changing service providers, but here, I mean, I, I do applaud them for being so transparent with the change and giving users a chance to opt out um, for at least two months. Mm-hmm. Professor, is this bad corporate behavior for companies to be taking away the class action right of its of its users? Well, this this makes me crazy at a lot of different levels. The, the Supreme, you know, Lisa's absolutely right. The Supreme Court has said it's fine. And in addition to the Concepcion case, it's a case from about a, uh, within the last year involving American Express and a, a little restaurant in Little Italy in New York called Italian Colors. And the Supreme Court just laid the hammer down. It was five to four. I urge everybody to read uh, Justice Kagan's dissent. It's brilliant. It's it's forceful. Um, it's the strongest. It basically says that American Express um, uh, forces all uh, merchant accounts to waive arbitration, uh, sorry, to, to waive litigation, engage in arbitration, and give up any collective arbitration so that all a restaurant could do in this case 
was bring an individual arbitration. And people need to know how it's different than litigation. Uh, arbitration, you pay a substantial filing fee as opposed to the $350, I think it is, in federal court to, to, to bring a case. You pay a case based on the amount of damages you claim. You pay for the arbitrator's time. You and the other side split that up. They don't work for free. Uh, obviously, a litigant can't pay a judge. That's called bribery and, and, and so on. In general, you're responsible for the other side's costs if you lose. And so no one in their right mind will bring a small dispute to arbitration. And the risk is companies will completely insulate themselves from liability, including the very li uh, the misuse of the very power that forces you into arbitrating something that, that, that you're never going to do. It's, it's, it's legal. It's terrible. Um, I commend Dropbox for both sending us all an email, which I received the other day, <laughs> and for providing this opt-out that Lisa talked about. I just want to say, you know, one one brief clarification. It's not free. It's sort of freemium. There's three or four different levels depending on how much storage space you use. So this does, in fact, affect a, a fair amount of uh, consumers who are paying real money, even even right now. Right, and and there's also the concern about the 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 whole issue of the the privacy aspect of this and you know whether or not Dropbox is working with uh, um, the NSA bring, to bring that up again. So Ryan, what do you think about, um, about, about companies doing this? Does this uh, you know, is it, are these good decisions for them to make in the marketplace? Sometimes they need any good decisions, especially when it's it's a service that's a low priced or unpriced. Of course, if I'm a user of a service that's and I suffer a loss, I want all remedies available to me. But if you look at from a dynamic perspective, do we if companies are making decisions about what products to develop and at what prices to charge, I can see lots of situations where limiting uh, your liability for as a company or even if even if arbitration effectively means that many avenues of recourse won't even be worthwhile, basically eliminating most of your liability might allow you to offer better products at a lower price than you otherwise would. Of course, there are challenges such as the fact that a lot of people don't read these, but to the extent that people are at least generally aware of what they're getting into, uh, which of course is a big if, there's, there are lots of benefits to be had by allowing these, uh, these limitations on liability, limitations on class action, limitations on litigation uh, to exist. Uh, one of the great things about the internet and shows like this and uh, the, the many intermediaries that disseminate information is that they are uh, are doing a lot of the work for consumers in reading contracts, noticing these changes that that people might not otherwise notice and publicizing them. You know, there have been several examples of companies changing the terms of service in response to outrage from users sparked by a very small percentage. To me, that sort of uh, cop on the beat that doesn't arise from government but arises out of out of the varying non private entities that are looking at these is the the best way to, to uh, balance these competing concerns of wanting companies to be able to uh, uh, adjust their liability to allow them to uh, deploy the best products uh, to consumers who maybe don't expect the ability to obtain recourse. They want to use the service as is and they understand what they're getting into. If you're not putting important data on Dropbox and you're willing to to lose it with and and have it maybe even be publicized without recourse, you should be allowed to do that. Of course, the information is the problem, but that's getting that's getting better, not worse as time goes on. So I would expect that that we should gradually become less skeptical of these arrangements, uh, even if there are some reasons to be skeptical today. Great. Uh, said very well from somebody who comes from an organization that pushes uh, individual uh, liberty. And uh, on that on that note, speaking of your, your organization, Ryan, uh, CEI, uh, switching topics here, you've, your organization, you were one of the co-authors on this, I believe, uh, filing some comments with the, um, wait, was it with the F FCC? It was the FCC. It wasn't the FAA. It was, it was FCC uh, in response to a notice of proposed rulemaking about the use of mobile devices on uh, aircraft. So uh, give us the, here you go, 30,000 foot view on uh, what those issues issues are. So for 23 years, it's been illegal uh, to use a cell phone on an airplane, uh, well, technically a cell phone on certain bands. Uh, but We'll set that aside. That's an FCC rule. There was also a longstanding FAA rule 
that also limited mobile devices. As we all know, late last year, that rule was lifted. So you can use a tablet and a smartphone at the same time from gate to gate now, uh, a, a, no, but not in transmit mode. The FCC rule, however, still prohibits many transmissions uh, during flight. However, many foreign countries have lifted these rules for flights above 10,000 feet or 300, 3,000 meters. So if you're flying abroad, in, in many cases, if you have a, a, a world a capable uh, phone, quad band GSM uh, or, or whatever, you will actually be able to get on what's called a Pico cell in your plane that is linked to a ground-based cell network, either via satellite or via uh, 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 spectrum. You can do data in some cases, text, and even in some cases voice, albeit at a higher rate than on the ground. Uh, of course, many people are worried that it would be terrible if it were uh, legal to use a cell phone to make a call on a plane. I understand those concerns, and I think that's exactly why Delta Airlines filed comments saying they have no plans to allow voice calls, regardless of what the agency does. What we argued in our comments was that the FCC should, as it is, uh, as it is uh, uh, moving toward, lift this rule and allow people to make cell phone calls, engage in cell phone data transmissions on aircraft that have installed the relevant equipment and obtained consent from the ground wireless providers to make it uh, uh, um, unlikely to cause interference with the ground network. I don't see a reason why the government needs to be involved in this. Of course, uh, so, uh, I would, would find it unfortunate for somebody to get on a plane, realize after they boarded bought the ticket that everyone is talking on the cell phone. But I'm guessing that the media, especially in this case, will report very aggressively on which airlines allow in-flight calls. Southwest has said maybe they will. Of course, the FCC has to act, but then this, this goes back into the uh, FAA's hands or the DOT, uh, which, which, which is technically statutorily the entity that has the ultimate uh, power broker here to finally allow this use in flight on U.S. airplanes. But I think there's a good chance that within the next uh, few years, we will see airlines start to offer in-flight mobile data, maybe in some cases voice. The benefit, of course, is instead of having to authenticate with go-go Wi-Fi or something, put in a credit card, you have a cell phone or a tablet that's already authenticated with your wireless provider. It reduces the hassle of, of billing uh, uh, which is which is one major benefit, along with the ability to make calls. I would note that in in for the many foreign countries that allow this, most voice calls that occur are very short, a few minutes long, because it's expensive to talk in flight, and people just generally have etiquette. Like you don't kick the seat in front of you, you don't chatter away for an hour, which is why I think it probably shouldn't be a governmental issue. I wish that I wish. etiquette would translate to the metra here in Chicago that you all are probably familiar with. So um, in your comments to the FCC, Ryan, you talked about this Supreme Court case from 1946 that resolved the issue of whether it was a trespass at common law for an aircraft to fly over private property. And the court held, uh, and you know, I'm certainly not quoting chapter and verse from the, the, the opinion here, but, and I'm greatly uh, glossing over some of the detail and nuance, summarizing, essentially, if you fly high enough over private property as to not bother the, the people in the property there, it's, it's not a trespass. How does that notion relate to this issue? Because I think it's, there's, there's got to be an interesting comparison that, that you're making here, but help us understand how that uh, case from 1946 relates to, to, to this situation. Sure. So the wireless carriers that we use, Verizon, AT&T, and so forth, own exclusive licenses for various bands of spectrum, whether it's 700 megahertz, PCS, and so forth. These companies bid, uh, place bids at auction for these exclusive licenses. Uh, if a plane is allowing users to make and receive cell phone calls, the question is, to what extent does the wireless carrier that owns the exclusive license first even own the rights at that level right now no wireless carrier actually can offer service at thirty-five thousand feet maybe you'll get service if you're traveling over the rockies where the antennas are at an unusually high altitude but gen they're not offering service that's usable at that level then there's the question what happens if one carrier says i consent to the airline using uh it's uh my spectrum in in each of its aircraft but another, uh, another carrier doesn't, is the aircraft or whichever company installs that uh, unit in the aircraft engaging in unlawful interference 
under the FCC's rules. Under the current rules, it would be if it were emitting anything even uh, beyond a very tiny well, um, amount of emissions on licensed spectrum. So one th issue the commission has to figure out is what exceptions it will create because it's not feasible to say that an airliner has to get consent from every single wireless carrier across the country because there aren't just the big four. There are lots of regional carriers that have spectrum in one market where a different carrier has spectrum 100 miles away or 1,000 miles away. So that's the analogy to the, the Cosby case, that uh, there are, there's a strong case to be made that the transaction costs of requiring negotiation to clear all rights would prohibit this from emerging. So there needs to be a balancing act that reflects this cost. What we propose is that airlines can operate on licensed spectrum without op permission from the carrier for the only for the purposes of uh, of lifting the noise floor, which prevents interference, and also to figure out which devices are compatible with the airline's Pico cell. Remember, though, that the the spectrum used to transfer this information from the plane to the ground is not the wireless carrier's spectrum. The, it's it's the, it's either a mobile satellite service or the air to ground link or something along those lines, or it could be it could be spectrum that hasn't even been put up for auction yet. We're only talking about the spectrum within the aircraft. To be, remember, because your cell phone can't communicate over all bands. It only is capable of operating on those bands that are, its radio support. So that's the issue. Whether that very minor interference where a cell phone connects to a Pico cell 50 feet away inside a plane to authenticate with Verizon or figure out if it's AT&T, in which case it gets no service. Whether that's an interference, we said it should not be. Although in, in the future, perhaps that will change if carriers begin to put balloons up in the sky, for instance, that operate using their spectrum uh, such that they might want to make use of the spectrum inside of aircraft. Since they're not using it right now, a very limited exception to their exclusive rights seems sensible to us. Great. Well, thank you for uh, bringing us up to up to date on that and the interesting work that your your organization is doing with the uh, the FCC on that. Um, so we're rolling things up here. We got to got to wrap things up here in the next few minutes. But uh, as you know, uh, if you are a, a frequent watcher of this week in law, we wrap up each episode with a, a tip of the week and a resource of the week. So. Uh, the tip this week is uh, how not to be a glass hole. Uh, there is a piece over on uh, CNN this week. Doug Gross over at CNN.com wrote a great piece talking about some, uh, some information that Google released uh, this week of some do's and don'ts to avoid uh, awkward moments if you become a user of Google Glass. And this, of course, is going to be introduced into the market later this year. So uh, just some common sense stuff here. Um, the tip would be to to review these uh, if you are going to uh, become a glass user. You know, do ask for permission. You know, it's just like using uh, the camera on your cell phone or something like that. Don't be creepy or rude if somebody asks you to take off uh, your Google Glass. Uh, you know, you know, comply. Um, you know, don't uh, don't glass out. That kind of is like going into your own little world uh, because you are so enthralled and so enamored. Uh, by reading, as it says here, reading war in peace uh, on your glass. Anybody plan to uh, become a glass hole? I mean, a glass user uh, <laughs> when these things go uh, on market? Lisa, you going to get get um, a pair? Uh, I'll I'll sit this one out. Uh, I'll wait for them to come out with frames that are more my style. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I, I think there are some new styles. That was one of the announcements here. So <laughs> we'll see what you like, Professor. What about you? Uh, not unless they develop a bifocal version. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Ryan, you're also an I, eyeglass. I'm, I'm pretty interested. I, I already wear glasses. Adding a little more weight doesn't seem like that big of a deal. I'd rather for it to be integrated into my, my eyeball or directly interfacing with my brain, but I suppose we'll have to wait a few decades for that. Uh, for now, being able to read emails while walking down the street sounds good to me. Might might not be so good for the other people, uh, but I think it's it should be interesting to, to try. I haven't tried it, so I, I'm not sure if I'll buy it, but I'm very interested. Good. Well, I bet we don't have to wait a few decades. I bet uh, I bet that integrated technology will will be here sooner. So the uh, the I have a couple of resources of the week uh, for you uh, if you are a Bitcoin enthusiast and worry uh, you know or concerned about the ongoing value of Bitcoin. You might want to check out the Wink Dex. This, of course, is named after the brothers Winklevi. Uh, they have put this uh, thing together. It's at winkdex.com. Lisa, I wonder if there's a trademark issue because uh, for the first time. <laughs> 
I look at it, it looks like Windex a little bit. So maybe Windex could be diluted uh, in this regard. But anyway, it's a, a blended price index designed to reflect the true price of Bitcoins. And you can go see how it, it fluctuates from, uh, from time to time. Let me go around the room and take a survey here. Lisa, do you own any Bitcoins? No, I'm very interested. It took a big dip last week, and uh, I'm just trying to figure out who is a legitimate source of Bitcoin, but I am very interested in it. Yeah. Professor, are you engaging in commerce in this fashion? Nope. I'm just studying it. Uh, I'm, I'm fascinated as to whether it's going to become sort of a, a tradable asset or really a, 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 a payment mechanism. I'm betting that it's going to end up being more of a, a investable commodity, and, and they're not going to achieve their goals of, uh, of of revolutionizing payment, but uh, what, what a great uh, attempt. Ryan, is this how you're going to retire? Uh, I don't think so. Speculative assets aren't my uh, aren't my, my cup of tea, but uh, as a payment system, I would be great if it takes off. I'm skeptical Bitcoin is going to be the one that revolutionizes payments, but it wouldn't surprise me if something like it someday <clears throat> does. Great. Finally, uh, this is probably the most important resource of the week for you. It's a, a brand new Tumblelog. Or Tumblelog. Does anybody still say Tumblelog anymore? A new Tumblr site. Uh, get ready for it here. Things that are cheaper than WhatsApp.tumblr.com. Uh, you know, we were kicking this around before the show started. Uh, and, you know, most things in this world are cheaper than the price of WhatsApp, which Facebook is going to be reportedly buying for something like $19 billion. So, uh, you know, some interesting things on this list. Uh, you know, for example, the Hubble Space Telescope, $10 billion cheaper than, you know, WhatsApp. The London Olympics were cheaper. Um, American Airlines, uh, the, uh, the country of Iceland, I think Jamaica, country of Jamaica. Here's one that kind of pulls at the heartstrings, right, Lisa? I think you mentioned this. Clean water and sanitation for the entire planet, $10 billion. So aren't we all a bunch of first world uh, glass holes, you know, to be thinking about uh, things like this, if we, if we could do that. So, uh, yeah, everybody take a look and uh, put things in perspective by checking out things that are cheaper than what's up tumblr.com some some very useful information <laughs> so um well that wraps it up let's go around the room and uh say our farewells uh professor waller great to to talk with you what a like i said what a privilege to uh, get your insight in depth uh on on these very current and, and interesting antitrust competition issues really appreciate you being on on the show thank you very much my pleasure. Anytime. Look forward to even talking about the antitrust stuff with uh, Facebook and uh, WhatsApp. Although I, I bet Ryan and I agree that uh, at the end of the day, that one doesn't pose any serious threats. Right. And I know that you have written a very uh, interesting paper about social media and antitrust concerns. So anybody who does a uh, search for your name on the SSRN network about that, I would commend that uh, interesting, interesting writing from a couple of years, but still very, very timely. So Thanks for Ryan Radia, Ryan Radia, great to talk with you again. Thanks. It's great to be back. Yes, yes. So, uh, you know, we look forward to, uh, to to talking with you again soon on some of these issues. Really do appreciate your commentary uh, and your insight on this. So it's uh, it's been great. Thank you. And uh, finally, Lisa Baradkin, great to talk with you again. You too. And I really enjoyed the discussion with Professor Waller and with Ryan. I uh, hope to see you around on social media, if not uh, WhatsApp in the future. <laughs> Sounds good. So good. And uh, thank you all very much for listening or watching episode 247 of This Week in Law 24-7. I guess we're coming at you that uh, with episode 247 here. So um, uh, be sure to uh, check us out on our Facebook page, also at twit.tv slash twill. Denise will be back uh, next week. Uh, you can always reach out to Denise or me at any time. She is Denise at twit.tv. I am Evan at twit.tv. She is D Howell on Twitter. I'm Internet Cases on Twitter. So uh, thanks everybody for watching and listening. Thanks to everybody in IRC for participating as well. And until next week, take care and we'll see you then.